Good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming. Uh, I'm a musicologist uh, who is interested in historic musical and sonic practices. I teach at Florida State University, so I didn't have to um, come very far um, for this particular uh, conference. So in my work as a historian, I've found digital technologies involving sound to be really useful for creating richer narratives and histories of past sensory experiences. I'm a historian of early America, and so that's really the focus of what I work on. In this um, paper this morning, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my recent book publication, which you can see here on the screen. It's called Moravian Soundscapes. It's a sonic history of the Moravian missions in early Pennsylvania. It was published um, through Indiana University Press. And it has a companion website, um, which you can also see on the screen, uh, moraviansoundscapes.music.fsu.edu. And so the goal of the website is to use sound recordings and digital and historic maps and archival materials from the Moravian archives in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and also Herrenhut, Germany, um, as well as place-based photography and um, other uh, documents to reconstruct the soundscapes of 18th century Moravian communities in Eastern Pennsylvania. And um, sound mapping and sound reconstructions not only provide new ways of communicating and presenting historical research on sound and music, but I think they're also a really important method for understanding the acoustic ecologies of early American communities. So as a book author, uh, Moravian Soundscapes was inspired by my desire to use my background in historical performance and sound design to really create a sounded history of the acoustic ecologies of these communities within the context of the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. So through a type of digital storytelling, I hoped I could um, you know, create a really compelling sonic rendering of this unprecedented period of cultural shift and physical co-presence between European settlers and native nations and communities by incorporating sensory data and knowledge in ways that would be really encouraging of participatory and place-based learning. So what I hoped readers would do is take the book and the website and actually go to these places that are discussed in the book and to sort of encounter them in a new way through a series of sound maps um, that contain various soundscape compositions, field recordings, and historically informed recordings of spoken texts and hymns um, in Mohican, German, Delaware, and English. So the sound maps all contain the GPS coordinates for places that are discussed in the book. And that way readers would hopefully have the option to actually go and listen in place. And so in creating these two things that would work together, a print book and a website, I hoped that um, you know, these new technologies such as digital sound mapping and soundscape composition, and in addition to older methodologies like historical performance, um, could sort of reorient the historical study of music and sounds to include an aural and spatial practice of history. Um, now, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the different sound components on the website and just kind of share those with you um, this morning. Here's a wonderful travel map um, that was created in the 18th century of Eastern Pennsylvania. So this is the terrain that we're talking about here between um, the Delaware River Valley and the Susquehanna River Valley and the mountain ranges that are kind of in between there and there is Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So this is a Moravian map um, that was created in the mid 18th century. And um, as I mentioned, the website also includes um, place-based photography. And um, so my students and I actually went out into the field and captured all of these places, not only in sound, but also um, through photography as well. So it's really a, a trans historical story that is being told through the website and the book. And I do want to give credit to my collaborators because like many large digital humanities projects, I didn't do this alone. 
Um, so one of the principal collaborators was geographer Mark Schuchetti, who I think is actually listening online this morning and who's presenting a paper um, tomorrow. Uh, he teaches at Jacksonville State University and also um, electronic composer and sound technician, um, Andy Nathan. And then many, many uh, students at Florida State also participated in this project. So the initial stages of the project actually ended up um, you know, going out into the field. Uh, it's been 275 years since many of these communities were founded. So we spent about two years doing spatial field work, just locating where many of these places and spaces were, and then um, you know, being able to map them and understand uh, how people might have navigated those spaces in the 18th century. Uh, and this is a picture of the Moravian community at Gnadenhutten, which is now called Lehighton, Pennsylvania, which is um, at the confluence of the Lehigh River and um, the creek that goes off the river here. It was a community that was up on a hill. It was a Delaware and Mohican Moravian community. Uh, so that's one of the places that we studied and mapped. Um, but once we had done this sort of field work, we were able to actually then produce digital maps of places in the 18th century, sort of georectifying um, 18th century maps against modern satellite data and also the field work that we had done to create a series of maps in ArcGIS. And it's then that we began to do some acoustical studies um, in places that still existed um, so one of those was the um, 18th century Gemeinde House, which was a meeting place and also a communal home in the 18th century. It's located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. That building does still exist. Uh, so we were able to actually go inside of it and produce uh, field recordings of that space and to understand how it functioned as an acoustical space. Um, we also visited a Moravian farm nearby called uh, Burnside Plantation, uh, and there are 12 different museums that preserve Moravian life and material culture in Bethlehem, so we recorded historic cookware and tools, we visited the reconstructed blacksmith shop um, there in the community in Bethlehem and did some field recordings that way. We also did some hymn singing in some of the original spaces that were intended um, for that type of spiritual singing. And here is a field recording. Um, so this is completely, um, it is not processed or edited in any way. So all of the resonance that you hear comes from the building itself. So we're singing up on the second floor of a stone building. The floor is wood. And um, the way that Moravians envisioned this is sort of like a, a acoustic resonator for the human voice, because you're basically suspended up in the air in the middle. Um, and they would actually sing into the floorboards. And the wood is actually an amazing conductor of sound. And uh, my students and I were able to experiment with that and to really understand you know, what was meant in 18th century texts that were describing this type of singing practice in an embodied way in the present. stop there. It was an amazing experience to sing into the wood of the floor. It was probably, it was like the best microphone <laughs> that I've ever used. And so it, it does definitely give you a sense of how people listened and how they sang and interacted with that space in the 18th century. Um, while we were doing various field recordings, we also made a series of um, decibel reading collections so that we could kind of understand how sound traveled over various spaces in the 18th century and how people might have heard and understood their community through listening. Um, so we ended up uh, processing those decibel readings through a mathematical formula that had originally been designed for studying noise pollution. 
Um, so it was actually capable of taking into account sound decay over different distances like agricultural fields, coniferous and deciduous forests, grasslands, et cetera, or urban and built environments. Um, and then we used actually a 18th century map. You can see a bit of it down here below where a Moravian cartographer had helpfully designated all of the different types of trees and terrain that were around um, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania to quite exact detail. And once we had rasterized this image or broken it down into um, its pixels, we were able to assign different values to those pixels for that type of terrain and create more detailed um, extent of how the sound might have traveled over the physical landscape um, in the 18th century. So that um, type of sound study is also present on the book's website. Uh, we also wanted to understand um, how places that no longer existed may have sounded. And for that, um, we really drew inspiration from many of the people who are um, been longstanding members of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology, and um, for instance, um, Barry Truax and Hildegard Westerkamp. And um, so what we were trying to do is create a simulated acoustic environment through composing soundscape compositions. Um, and we would create these either from digitally layered field recordings and pre-recorded sound samples, um, or we would actually um, incorporate recordings of things we were not able to record in the field um, into these uh, soundscapes. We also um, talked with researchers who were familiar with the pronunciation of German and Mohican in the 18th century, um, and they were able to read texts and ar other archival documents from Moravian communities to mix into these recordings. And there are many, many of them on the website, um, but I'll just uh, give you an example of one of these um, for today. This is a Mohican sermon that would have been done in this community of Kanadenhutten uh, in Pennsylvania. You can see the Mohican modern text below. There's the archival document, and this is being read by Christopher Harvey. Um, who is writing his doctoral dissertation on Mohican. He's at the University of Toronto. And um, in it, we tried to simulate what hearing that sermon in the wooden environment of this small building or worship space, which is right there, um, would have sounded like. Ne tahkanak. Nechesh Moshak Jesus quit the man him on, Gane o top do na wanganen. Jesus was so me son a nachgata. Bomb quitch nane, o top by yo we non, ob gachganom. Jesus ob, Nya, by moan no ma ma we. Jesus ma we o hagai, Gamein gunan op. Eh. Giano wonk ma we, men on to katahano. Jesus mama chow nach gab. Ba mouse a hap nap gopane, keg a hap, pa pont que geche. So it's maybe a little hard to hear um, in here, but there is actually a room a room tone and a sense of a spatial environment for that type of wooden building, which will probably be easier to hear with, with headphones. Um, my students and I in the historical performance program at FSU also recorded a series of hymns in different languages. Um, this is a part of the um, book's website where we did a series of eight hymns in Mohican. It was, uh, took a whole year um, to reconstruct these hymns to be able to sing them because Mohican is not currently a spoken language but is in the process of revitalization. So just figuring out how accurately these 18th century texts conveyed this spoken language and being able to match the tunes back to them, which required transatlantic research, bringing tunes from Germany um, to match to these manuscripts with the text um, was quite an extensive process, but readers can also go and listen um, to those things as well. Um, so all taken into account, um, you know, our, our hope was that this sort of 
sonic storytelling would really enliven the experience of a print book and bring uh, a sense of, um, to quote uh, Richard, uh, Peter Charles Hoffer, um, the sensory worlds of early America. And that this kind of sonic and spatial and also place-based approach might reach different audiences than um, a printed history book would normally reach and just encourage a deeper engagement with the acoustic ecologies and history of this country. Thank you.